We come together expecting, expecting to hear from God from his word. Amen? Not because of who we are, but because of who he is. And not because we're so smart and clever, but because he is merciful. And he reveals himself to his children. Praise the Lord. And so as we go to the Word of God, we, we go expecting. If you look in your bulletin, you'll find an outline for today's message. We'll also see uh, the outline on version, the Bible app, and you'll also see it on the screen. We're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. But before we do, I want to pray. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, it's so easy for us to be distracted. It's so easy for us to be deceived. And so we're praying for your Holy Spirit to illuminate our minds, to help us understand your word. Help us, as the, as the psalmist prayed, to see wonderful things in your word, Lord. And give us the courage and the strength to apply what we hear from your word and if there's anyone here, Lord, who doesn't yet know you as their Lord, their Savior, the joy of their life, that you would draw them to yourself and that they would fully surrender to you, Lord, asking you to forgive their sins and be the Lord of their life. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people said, now, now Paul has been telling the church of Ephesus through this letter in the, all kinds of powerful things. First, he told them in the first chapter, that they, that they had been chosen by God. He also told them that they had been redeemed by Christ and that they'd been sealed by the Holy Spirit. In the second chapter, he, he told them that they'd been saved. They, they'd been saved from their sin. They'd been saved from the world, the world that would pressure them to do the wrong things. They'd been saved from demonic forces. They've been saved from their own destructive passions. And they've been saved from the righteous and holy anger of God. And they weren't saved by what they did, we found, but they're saved by grace through faith. It was a gift of God that opened their eyes to see their need for Christ, and they had surrendered. And then, and then he told them, especially speaking to the Gentiles, that you have become co-citizens, and fellow heirs with the Jewish people. Praise the Lord. It's, it's an amazing thing. And Paul is writing from prison this letter. There's, there's some discussion, some scholars, many scholars for many years believe he was writing when he was in prison in Rome. Some have said, no, I think it was earlier when he was in prison in Ephesus. What we know for sure is he was in prison. And so I want to get right to the word. Ephesians 3, 1 through 13. For this reason. For what reason? Because they're fellow citizens, co-heirs. Because they've been redeemed. Because they've been chosen. Because they've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles. It's, He's saying, I, I, I'm in prison, not because of the political forces, not because of all these things, but because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Isn't that the right perspective? And on behalf of you Gentiles. If Paul would have just said the gospel is just for Jewish people, if he went to reach out to the Gentiles, he probably wouldn't have got himself in so much trouble. Verse 2. Assuming that you have heard the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. How the mystery was made known to me by revelation. As I have written briefly. Let me just pause here and say, this is how we come to know God, by his revelation. He reveals it to us. He shows himself in creation, but we need more than that. So he, so he reveals himself through his word and through the working of his Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. When you read this, 
you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. We have some Jewish folks that gather with us in, in, in background, but most of us are Gentiles. Do you ever marvel at the fact that you're included in? Let's continue to read verse 7. Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me... Though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Did you catch it? What he's saying? The church, the church, people from every tribe and nation coming together. It, it displays the glory of God and the manifold witness to the wisdom of God. It's an amazing thing. There's some discussion here, who these rulers and authorities in heavenly places are. Some have talked about, is he talking about demonic forces or angels? But we know the angels do long to look into this, this mystery, this wonderful thing called the gospel. Verse 11, this was according to the eternal purpose, and I think that's the right translation. It could be Purpose through the ages, but I think eternal purpose. Isn't that amazing? Our God has eternal purposes. The church wasn't an afterthought. It was the eternal purpose of God that he would save people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation. This was according to the eternal purpose that he, is re that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness, boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So he's saying, you have access now. Be because you've been chosen by God, redeemed by the Holy Spirit, I mean, redeemed by Christ, sealed by the Holy Spirit, you have access to go to God with, with confidence, with boldness, a boldness to speak. Because of what Christ has done, marvel at that. It's an amazing thing. And we'll talk about that as we go through the points. You think about the Holy of Holies that the high priest got to go in once a year, right? And we have direct access to God through Christ. Praise the Lord. That's an amazing thing. You see, what happens sometimes, and I'm getting ahead of myself a little here because I get so excited about this. Sometimes we forget that God is holy, that he's mighty. People will say to us things like, I don't feel worthy to go before God. The answer is, you're not, neither am I. It's only because of what Christ has done. Right? Then verse 13, he says this, So I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. It's, it's an interesting thing he says there. What, what's, what's his point? We'll, we'll get to it. But I think he wants them to know they can have boldness and confidence in going to Christ. And, that, and you don't need to be discouraged because they threw me in prison. Okay. Let's get right into it today. What is a mystery? A mystery in the New Testament sense is a technical term pertaining to a truth which because of its character, can never be attained unto or arrived at by the unaided 
human intellect or by mere human ability. So mystery, and the scripture talks about mystery, it's something that you and I wouldn't come to know on our own. It's in the counsel of God, and it's in some ways a secret that is only going to be known by the Holy Spirit revealing it to us. Praise the Lord. And we're, and we're going to get into that. I want to, I want to draw out some points to this passage. One, Paul is in prison because of the Gentiles and the mystery of the gospel. That's why he's there. Now, the application, if you want to write an application, I wrote an application to every point. The application is we should not avoid life-changing truth in fear of losing popularity or to avoid suffering. Sometimes you're going to do the right thing and people aren't going to like it. Can I repeat that to you? Sometimes you're going to do the right thing and people aren't going to like it. Don't stop doing the right thing because some people don't like it. Is it possible that the reason that so many people are walking away from the church and so many ministers are quitting is because we put popularity over the call? Does that make sense? Jesus never said, if you follow me, you'll be popular. He never said you won't go through hard times. He did say, I've sealed you with the Holy Spirit, guaranteeing what's to come, which is a, a kingdom without pain, a, a kingdom of the new heaven and the new earth. Praise the Lord. When you see people struggle and suffer, no, that does not mean that God is against them. And it does not mean, it does not mean that God is not there. In, in my ministry in the last years, I've often been told, please don't use this word or don't say, talk about that thing or don't talk about this thing. And sometimes the very things that, that they're asking us not to talk about are the things that people are falling into, right? So I told one person, <laughs> when I was in the sixth grade, I, I had a birthday party and we took all of... My friends, we went on a hike, and we all got a bad case of poison ivy. Right? Really bad. It might be wise for a parent to say, I might want to warn you about poison ivy. There's quite a bit around here, which, by the way, my parents did. I just didn't listen. But to say, well, don't talk about poison ivy because it upsets some people wouldn't be right. What are the things that our culture is falling into, Right? Misunderstanding about, about gender, misunderstanding about sexuality, misunderstanding about life, misunderstanding about these things. You can't just say, I'm not going to talk about them because people might get upset. What you have to say is, is the Holy Spirit leading us in our conversations to bring glory to God? Amen? Amen? See, see, how did the church say nothing about the racism that was so rampant for a while in America? For the same principle, they just don't talk about it. You can stay popular if you don't say much about that. Second thing I want to show us in this passage, and, I, and if you don't see it in the passage, then you don't remember it. But if you see it here, and I think you can see it here, um, then let's figure out how to apply it to our lives by the grace of God and through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, through the apostles and prophets, has revealed a mystery that was not known in past generations. There's something that we see in the New Testament that was, it was concealed in the Old Testament. Would you agree? Some, some writers have said that the gospel is revealed in the Old, New Testament and concealed in the Old. There's some, there, there's some things there that if we look back, we look through the Old Testament. That's why, by the way, I absolutely love going through the, the Jews... For Jesus material, like Christ and the Passover. And you can see all of these things that pointed to Christ. But, but many of them had to be revealed by the Holy Spirit to us. Right? They, were, they were mysteries. And so the application is we should use the truths we find in the New Testament to help us understand the Old Testament. Amen? Third thing we see here. The mystery is that the Gentiles become one with the Jews and are saved and inherit, and inherit the promises given to Israel through Christ's death and resurrection. I don't know any other way to take the fact that you say your fellow citizens can co-heirs with us. 
right? You can, you can, there's some discussion about what happens with the nation of Israel. I'm not going to get into that, but what I'm going to say is we're one in Christ. Is that the whole point? Is that the whole point? You're one. Praise the Lord. And what's the application there? The application is we should preach the gospel to both Jews and non-Jews. Everyone can be saved by Christ. That's what Paul in Romans would say. He's unashamed of the gospels because it's salvation first to the Jews and also to the Gentiles. Praise the Lord. Fourth thing. The gospel reveals the internal purposes of God. You saw we, we underlined that verse, right? And I encourage you to reread this passage and you see it there, the internal purpose of God. The application there is we reject the idea that the church was God's plan B. In fact, the manifold witness and wisdom of God is made known through the church. Think about that. This, one commentator is saying that Sin was God's greatest problem, and he didn't know if there was a more appropriate way to say it than the problem, but how, how was God to, to redeem a people who had rejected him? How could a holy God deal with a sinful people? How could he bring them to himself? The animal sacrifices of the Old Testament couldn't do it, right? They could only point to the one who could. Christ. And there was a marveling throughout all creation. <laughs> Through the, I believe the angels, they rejoice in salvation. They look and they go, this is unbelievable. God is calling people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation to himself. Can I get an Amen. For many years, uh, Paige taught English as a second language to refugee children. And, and I remember taking some of the kids to church with us and their amazement when we told them, you know, you don't have to pray in English. God loves your people. He's a plan for them. Now, you, you may say, well, I, that, that doesn't seem like such a big deal. Those little kids in the back seat of our car knew it was a big deal. This is the eternal purpose of God. He's calling people from every tribe and every town and every nation. It was the plan from the beginning. Praise the Lord. Another application here is that we should value and honor the church and we should seek the well-being of the church. Amen. Fifth thing I pick out of this passage is that in Christ we can boldly access God and live in confidence. Think, think about it. Those of you who've read through your Bible in the year or, or go through the Bible, you get to those passages like Leviticus. You're trying to understand all of these things that it took to get to God. All the building of the tabernacle and the temples and the sacrifices. And, the, and all that was to point this, that God is holy and we are not. Remember the, the vision that Isaiah had when the glory of... God was all around him. What did he say? I, I'm, a, I'm a man of unclean lips, among a people of unclean lips. We will not understand the gospel until we understand the holiness of God. The gospel is not for righteous people. The, right, the, the righteous don't need save from their sins. You and I do.
God doesn't become less concerned about sin in the New Testament. Sin has always been a serious problem. But praise the Lord, he's provided a way, a way that we can have access to God. I can still remember, I can still remember being a little guy. And my parents, they, they, they knew some of the teachings of Jesus, but they didn't know the hope of Christ when I was young. They came to know him later. And I knew some things about God, but he seemed distant. And my sins seemed big. And ultimately, I was kind of angry anyway at people. I'd go to Sunday school and they'd say, you're supposed to be kind to people. I wasn't sure I wanted to be kind. And then it... And then it happened. God opened my eyes. I was just a little guy. He opened my eyes to see that I didn't have to work my way up to God. He was reaching down to me. And I don't know if you've had those moments where, where you were so aware of the greatness and grandeur and holiness of God that you couldn't even stand on your feet any longer. But I've had those moments. And I just had to lay on the ground. Help me, Lord. Help me. I need a Savior. Mighty. Yeah, I need you to be mighty, God. I need you to be holy, God. I, 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 don't, I don't want a God who's just like other people. I, I need something greater than that. I need you mighty. There's so much in this broken world that threatens me. So many enemies around me. I need you mighty. I need a mighty Savior. But merciful, merciful, because I've thought things I shouldn't think, and I've done things I shouldn't have done, and there's no excuse for it, Lord. I don't want you to lessen your holiness so I can have access to you. And then Jesus Reminds me, God is holy. And by the grace of God, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, you are a saint. You are called by his name. He has saved you. He is saving you. He will save you. And one day, he'll finish the work he began in you. And together, with people from every tribe and every dung and every nation, you'll praise his name forevermore. Amen. In Christ, we have the ability to boldly access God and live in confidence. What's the application? We should acknowledge that without Christ, we cannot boldly come to God. I read a secular writer one time, somebody who didn't know the Lord, and they were mocking Christianity and talking about how they'd prayed some things and it didn't come to be. Let me be real clear here. The only right we have to ask anything from God was purchased for us by Christ. Amen. We say things, and then sometimes we don't think about what we're saying. In Jesus' name, what's the end? We pray. In the character of Christ, because of what he's done, we pray. Amen?
too. We should boldly, ex- boldly access God and live with confidence. We should know that we have the right to go before God, and we should because of what Christ has done. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. How about you? Have have you experienced that? Have you felt your emotions just just lifted because you can go before God. Because the cross has cleansed you and given you access. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I probably tell this story more often than I should because it touched me so much. I was talking to my friend Harry, who's now went to be with the Lord. Uh, Many of you have heard me talk about Harry. Harry came to the jail Bible study I was doing to make fun of me. He told me that. And one day I said to Harry, "You, you can't not believe in a God you hate so much. Led to further conversations. He ended up giving his life to the Lord. But I remember one day, every every week he'd come in and meet with me. He had federal and state charges, and they dropped the state charges to pursue the federal charges. So there was a little period of time that he was out, and he'd come every day, um, every day, I mean, once a week. And one time we were talking about this. I don't remember all the details, but I remember he went away, and he came back the next week, and he said, after we were talking about the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man, I was walking home, and I looked at my fingernail, and under the fingernail there was grease. He used to work on cars. And he said, and I, and I realized that I wasn't worth the grease under my fingernails because of the things I'd done, kind of thing. I almost interrupted him to talk more about the grace and love of God and all of those things. But I'm glad I didn't. Harry looked up at me, tears rolling down his big... Well, he was, just a, he, was a, he was just a tough guy, and here are these tears rolling down. And he says, to think that Jesus loves me. He really loves me. That changed everything for Harry. People say, how how did did you get a chance to share Christ with so many people? How did you get so many places? Part of it was Harry. Literally, people would come into my church office and go, if you can help Harry, you can help me. That's how it would go. Because Harry sold sold myth to about everybody in town. He got his federal charges. And and people began to see a difference in Harry's life. And and I can tell you, Harry became one of my friends. And some of you know, um, there's more to the story. One day I got a call when I was here, at the church here, I got a call that said, hey, uh, I don't know if you know Harry. Um, he gave his last name and I said, yeah, I know him. He said, we just found him in a ditch. He had some health concerns and he'd, he'd collapsed. Uh, he'd kind of fainted in his car ran into a ditch. And your number was in his phone, so we're giving you a call. So that, that led me... Um, I feel like I've jumped a lot of the story because what happened was Jerry went, uh, um, Harry went to prison for seven years, got out of prison, came back and was meeting with us again, and then I got a call to come out here. So I hadn't seen Harry in a while. I'd been here for a while. I get this call that they found him 
in a kind of unconscious in a ditch and find out that it was a health concern. He hadn't relapsed on drugs or anything. And that reconnected me. And then, and then <clears throat> Perry said, I miss you. I miss our once a week. And I said, how about we get once a week again? And so once a week while I was here, he would call on the phone and I would have a time of prayer and a time with Harry. And Harry was also connected to a lot of people in the church that we'd been in before, but he missed our friendship and I missed him. And we grew closer and closer to the Lord, and he got to share with a lot of folks. And the day that Harry died, his son called me and said, Dad wants to talk to you. I was able. I said, put, put the phone by Harry's ear, and I could say, Harry, remember, God loves you, and I love you. He said, I know. In my office, I have a card from Harry, I think, I don't know if I can, you know, moving the offices. It says simply this, thanks for introducing me to Jesus. The whole point in all that story, which, by the way, was nowhere in my notes, is this. I want all of us sharing our faith and, and getting friends like Harry. Amen? And knowing that God loves us. It's amazing that we can have access to God. Let's go to point six. Paul's suffering was for the glory of God, and it should not cause anyone to lose heart. See, they, they may have been tempted to say, look, all this thing about confidence in the Lord, all, all this thing about access to God, maybe God hasn't really forgiven us. Maybe he hasn't really chosen us. Maybe we haven't sealed it. Because, I mean, you've been thrown in jail. He wants to say, don't lose heart because I'm in jail. God's using it. God's using it. Paul doesn't see himself as a victim of the political system. He doesn't see himself as a pawn in somebody else's scheme. He sees himself as a child of God, apostle of God, called by Christ with a ministry. Amen? Application is this. The suffering of Christians should not cause us to lose confidence. Today they rushed in and arrested me as your pastor. I, I hope you wouldn't lose confidence in the Lord. Amen. This bold access that we have, this bold confidence we have to go to God, it should make a difference in how we live. Can you get an amen on that? People should see it. They should marvel. She, if the angels are looking down and saying, I, I can't. Look at this thing that's happening. People from tribes and nations all around the world are getting united in, in Jesus Christ. Sinful people are being made into saints. It's an amazing thing. Look at the wisdom of God and how he did it. Look at this. Come look. Then the world ought to be seeing something different in the church. And you and I, we have the ability to boldly access God. Have you taken advantage of that? And I'm going to ask the praise team to come. I ended with a, with a quote on my, my sermon notes here today, and I hope that you'll um, see the connection here. We don't like risky faith. We like to have our safety net below us, a backup plan in case God fails. Our instinct for self-preservation leads us to hedge our bets. We will give only as much as we can without really feeling it. We take away the high stakes and lose the high returns. We miss the adventure of seeing God provide when we, are, when we have stretched our faith in radical giving. This is Randy Alcorn talking. and He says, A.W. Towser wrote, The man of pseudo-faith will fight for his verbal creed, but refuse flatly to allow himself to get into a predicament where his future must depend on that creed being true. He always provides himself with the secondary ways of escape so we'll have a way out if the roof caves in. What we need very badly these days is a company of Christians 
who are prepared to trust God as completely now as they know they must do at the last day. The same God who calls us to himself through Christ that will usher us into heaven empowers us to live boldly. If you don't know Jesus, the the next step is to surrender your life to him. Ask him to be your Lord and Savior and the boss of your life. And and if you look through your, your bulletin, there's all kinds of opportunities to get involved. You pray about what the next step is for you, but we want to know about your commitment to Christ and, and, and come alongside you in that. If you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior, maybe you've been coming to church for years, you come in and you come out, but, you, but you've not marveled in a long time at the greatness of your God. The holiness of God has, has, has not overwhelmed you in a while. May you feel his presence. May, may you know who he is. Maybe your sinfulness has, has got you thinking that there's no room for me. God, God doesn't want me. Look at what I've done. There's no sin so great that it cannot be wiped away by the blood of Christ. Amen? From a guy who was making fun of me for bringing a Bible study to a jail to a dear friend for many years who's now waiting with Jesus. For the day we'll all be united. That's the journey. The journey we make by the grace of God and for his glory. Because we truly serve a great God.